The flickering lights of the cinema marquee reflected off my windshield as I sat in my car, filling out a check to pay my bills. I had just gotten off work and decided to stop here to unwind a bit before heading home. The parking lot was mostly empty, just a few cars scattered here and there, the occasional passerby hurrying to catch a movie. Out of nowhere, I heard a light tapping on my window. Startled, I looked up and saw two boys standing next to my car. They looked like twins with pale faces and dark hair. But it was their eyes that caught my attention. Completely black, void of any whites or pupils, a chill ran down my spine. Excuse me, sir, one of them said, his voice unnervingly calm and polite. Could you give us a ride home? We forgot our money for the movie and it's starting soon. An inexplicable fear gripped me. Those eyes. Something was deeply wrong. I tried to compose myself, forcing a smile onto my face as I rolled down the window slightly. Ah, uh, I'm sorry, but I can't, I stammered, trying to keep my voice steady. I need to get home myself. The boys didn't move. They stood there staring at me with those unsettling black eyes, their faces expressionless. The air around us seemed to grow colder. Please, sir, the second boy chimed in. It's just a short drive. We need to get our money. Their voices were insistent, almost hypnotic, but I could feel my instincts screaming at me to get away. My hands were shaking as I gripped the steering wheel, trying to avoid their piercing gazes. I really can't, I said again, more firmly this time, hoping they would take the hint and leave. But they didn't. They just kept staring, their eyes boring into me. The feeling of dread intensified. My heart was pounding in my chest, and I could feel cold sweat trickling down my back. This wasn't normal. I had to get out of here. Without another word, I started the engine and shifted into drive. The boys' expressions didn't change. They just stood there, watching me as I pulled away. As I drove off, I glanced in the rearview mirror and saw them standing in the same spot, their black eyes following me until I turned the corner. My mind was racing as I sped away from the theater. What had just happened? Those boys... Those ease, I couldn't shake the feeling of terror that had gripped me. I knew one thing for sure, I had made the right decision to leave them behind. But as I continued down the empty streets, the image of their eyes stayed with me, a haunting reminder of an encounter I couldn't explain. I drove through the night, my hands gripping the steering wheel so tightly my knuckles turned white. The city lights blurred past as I navigated through the empty streets, my mind racing with what had just transpired. The black-eyed boys, their cold, expressionless faces, how could something so bizarre happen on a normal night like this? I finally reached my apartment, a modest one-bedroom in a quiet neighborhood. As I pulled into my parking spot, I took a deep breath, trying to steady my nerves. I couldn't shake the image of those boys, their eerie presence lingering in my mind like a dark cloud. After locking my car, I hurried inside, locking the door behind me as soon as I stepped into my apartment. The familiarity of my surroundings brought a small measure of comfort. I tossed my keys onto the kitchen counter and went straight to the living room, collapsing onto the couch. My heart was still racing, and I felt a cold sweat on my forehead. I needed to talk to someone, to make sense of what had happened. I grabbed my phone and dialed the number of my best friend, Mike. He answered on the second ring. Hey, John. What's up? Didn't expect a call from you this late. Mike, you won't believe what just happened, I said, my voice trembling. I recounted the entire encounter with the boys, every detail etched vividly in my mind. Mike listened quietly, and when I finished, there was a long pause. Man, that's... that's creepy, Mike finally said. I've heard stories about be black eyed kids before. Urban legends, you know? People say they show up and ask for help, but there's something off about them. I always thought it was just internet nonsense. Urban legends, I echoed, feeling a chill run down my spine. So, you think they were real? I don't know, John, Mike admitted. But it sounds like you did the right thing by getting out of there. Those stories never end well for people who let the kids in or help them out. The thought was unsettling, but it brought a strange sense of relief. Maybe I wasn't going crazy after all. Thanks, Mike. I just needed to talk to someone about it. Any time, man. Just stay safe, all right? And maybe keep your doors locked tonight. I hung up the phone and sat in silence for a moment. 
urban legends or not, the fear I felt was real. I decided to follow Mike's advice and double-check that all the windows and doors were securely locked. Then, I turned off the lights and went to bed, hoping sleep would bring some respite from the haunting memories. But as I lay in the darkness, every creak and groan of the apartment seemed amplified, each shadow more menacing. The boys' faces, their black eyes, stayed with me, a constant reminder of the strange and terrifying encounter. I couldn't shake the feeling that this was far from over. Finally, exhaustion took over, and I drifted into a restless sleep, my dreams filled with the image of those black-eyed children and the unshakable fear that they would somehow find me again. I woke up to the sound of my phone buzzing on the nightstand. Groggy and disoriented, I reached for it, squinting at the screen. It was a text message from my boss, reminding me of an early morning meeting. I groaned, rubbing the sleep from my eyes the remnants of last night's nightmare still clinging to my mind. The events of the previous night came rushing back, the black-eyed boys and the fear that had gripped me. I shook my head trying to focus on the present. I had to get to work and try to put this all behind me. After a quick shower and a cup of strong coffee, I grabbed my briefcase and headed out the door. The morning was cool and crisp, the city just starting to wake up. As I walked to my car, I couldn't help but glance around half expecting to see the boys lurking somewhere nearby. But the parking lot was empty, and I breathed a small sigh of relief. The drive to work was uneventful, and I began to feel a bit more at ease. Maybe it had all just been a bizarre, isolated incident. I parked my car and made my way into the office, greeting my co-workers and settling into the routine of the day. But as the morning went on, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. I found myself glancing out the window more often than usual, half expecting to see those haunting black eyes staring back at me. My concentration was shot, and by lunchtime, I was thoroughly frazzled. I decided to step out for some fresh air, hoping a walk would clear my head. The streets were bustling with people, the normalcy of it all somewhat comforting. I wandered, trying to push the memories away, when I noticed something that made my heart skip a beat. Across the street, standing near a bus stop, were the two boys. They were just standing there, watching me, their black eyes as unnerving as ever. Panic surged through me. How had they found me, and what did they want? I quickly turned and started walking in the opposite direction, my mind racing. I had to get away, find somewhere safe. But as I glanced over my shoulder, I saw them following me, their pace steady and relentless. My pulse quickened and I broke into a run, weaving through the crowded streets, desperate to lose them. I darted into a nearby coffee shop, hoping the crowd would provide some cover. My chest heaved as I tried to catch my breath, scanning the entrance for any sign of the boys. Minutes passed, and there was no sign of them. Maybe I had lost them. I ordered a coffee, my hands still shaking, and found a seat in the corner where I could keep an eye on the door. My mind was racing with questions. Why were they following me? What did they want? And more importantly, how could I stop them? As I sipped my coffee trying to calm my nerves, my phone buzzed with a message. It was from an unknown number. With a sense of dread, I opened it. The message was simple and chilling. We need to talk. I felt a cold sweat break out on my forehead. Whoever they were, they weren't going to give up. I had to figure out what was happening and how to protect myself. The fear that had gripped me last night was back, stronger than ever. I knew one thing for certain. This was far from over and I needed answers before it was too late. The coffee shop felt both like a refuge and a trap. I stared at the message on my phone, my mind spinning. Who were these boys and why were they so intent on contacting me? My instincts told me to run, but a part of me knew I couldn't keep running forever. I had to confront them and find out what they wanted. I took a deep breath and typed a response. Where? Almost immediately, a reply came back. Outside. Now, my heart pounded in my chest. I glanced around the coffee shop, looking for any sign of the boys, but they weren't inside. Slowly, I stood up, pocketed my phone, and made my way to the exit. As I pushed open the door, the cool air hit my face, and I scanned the street. There they were, standing a few yards away their black eyes fixed on me.
I hesitated, every instinct screaming at me to turn and run, but I forced myself to walk towards them. My steps were slow and cautious, my mind racing with possible escape routes if things went south. When I was close enough, I stopped. What do you want? I demanded, my voice trembling despite my efforts to sound firm. The boys looked at each other, then back at me. One of them stepped forward, his expression unreadable. We need your help, he said, his voice calm and unnervingly mature for a child. Help, I repeated, incredulous. Why me? And what's with your eyes? The boy ignored my question. There's something we need to show you. Something important. Please, come with us. Every fiber of my being told me to refuse, but their calm demeanor and the inexplicable pull I felt toward them made me hesitate. Why should I trust you, I asked trying to buy time to think. We don't want to hurt you, the other boy said. We just need your help. You're the only one who can see us, the only one who can understand. This made no sense. Why me? But something in their voices, their eyes, told me they were telling the truth, or at least a version of it. Against my better judgment, I found myself nodding. Fine, but if this is some kind of trick, it's not, the first boy assured me. Follow U.S. They turned and started walking down the street, and I followed a few steps behind, my mind racing with possibilities. We walked for several blocks, the city around us bustling with life, but it felt like we were in a bubble of silence. Finally, we reached an old, abandoned building. The boys led me through a side entrance, and we descended a set of creaky stairs into a dimly lit basement. The air was musty, and the only light came from a few flickering bulbs. What is this place? I asked, trying to keep the tremor out of my voice. The boys didn't answer. Instead, they guided me to a small room at the back of the basement. Inside was a makeshift altar, covered in strange symbols and surrounded by candles. In the center was an old, weathered book. We need you to read from this, the first boy said, pointing to the book. Why? I asked, eyeing the book suspiciously. It will help us, the second boy explained. It will break the curse. Curse? The whole situation was becoming more surreal by the second. What curse? Our eyes, the first boy said, his voice tinged with sadness. We've been cursed for centuries. Only someone with your sight can break it. I looked at the book, then back at the boys. Their eyes, once terrifying, now seemed filled with desperation. Against all logic, I felt a surge of empathy. Taking a deep breath, I stepped forward and picked up the book. The pages were filled with strange, archaic text, but as I began to read aloud, the air around us seemed to hum with energy. The boys stood close, their eyes locked on me. The room grew colder, and I felt a strange sensation like the weight of centuries pressing down on me. But I kept reading, the words flowing through me like a river of power. As I reached the final passage, there was a blinding flash of light. I stumbled back, dropping the book. When I opened my eyes, the boys were gone. The room was silent, the altar empty. I stood there trying to process what had happened. The fear that had gripped me was gone, replaced by a strange sense of peace. Whatever curse had bound the boys, it seemed, had been lifted. I left the building, stepping back into the bright daylight. The city carried on as if nothing had happened, but I felt changed as if I had glimpsed something beyond the ordinary. As I walked home, I couldn't shake the feeling that this was just the beginning. The world was full of mysteries, and I had just scratched the surface. And though I didn't understand why, I knew I had played a part in something much larger than myself. The walk back to my apartment felt surreal. The sun was shining and people were going about their daily lives, but I felt disconnected from it all. My mind kept replaying the events in that basement, the strange symbols, the old book, and the boys with their haunting black eyes. Had I broken a centuries-old curse, or had it all been some bizarre hallucination? When I finally reached my apartment, I locked the door behind me and collapsed onto the couch. The adrenaline from the confrontation had worn off, leaving me exhausted and overwhelmed. I needed to make sense of what had happened, but I had no idea where to start. I grabbed my phone and called Mike again. He answered on the first ring. John, you sound like you've seen a ghost, he said, concern evident in his voice. 
I don't know what I've seen, I admitted. But something happened. Something. You unbelievable. I recounted the encounter with the boys, the basement, the book, everything. Mike listened in silence, and when I finished, there was a long pause. That's insane, Mike finally said. I mean, curses? Really? Are you sure you're okay, man? I don't know, I confessed. It all felt so real, and now they're just gee gone. Maybe you should take a break, get out of the city for a bit, Mike suggested. Clear your head. This sounds like a lot to process. Yeah, maybe you're right, I said, though I wasn't sure a break would help. I'll think about it. Thanks, Mike. After hanging up, I sat in silence trying to process everything. The boys had said I was the only one who could see them, the only one who could break the curse. But why me? What made me so special? I decided to take Mike's advice. A change of scenery might help me sort through the confusion. I packed a small bag and headed out, driving aimlessly, until I found myself at a small, secluded cabin I had rented a few times before for weekend getaways. It was quiet and isolated, the perfect place to think. The first night at the cabin was restless. Every noise outside made me jump, and the silence inside was oppressive. I kept the lights on, afraid of what might lurk in the shadows. The boys' faces haunted my thoughts, their black eyes staring at me even when I closed my own. The next day, I decided to distract myself with a hike. The fresh air and physical exertion helped clear my mind a bit, but I couldn't completely shake the feeling of unease. As I walked through the dense forest, I kept glancing over my shoulder, half expecting to see the boys following me again. By the time I returned to the cabin, I was exhausted but slightly more at peace. I made a simple dinner and settled in with a book, trying to focus on something other than the events of the past few days. But just as I was beginning to relax, my phone buzzed with a new message. I hesitated before opening it, a sense of dread washing over me. The message was from another unknown number. We're not finished yet. My heart sank. I had hoped that breaking the curse would be the end of it, but it seemed that whatever I had gotten myself into was far from over. I glanced around the cabin, the familiar surroundings suddenly feeling foreign and threatening. I needed answers, and I couldn't get them alone. I decided then and there to find someone who could help me make sense of this. There had to be experts in the paranormal, people who knew about curses and supernatural phenomena. I wasn't going to rest until I found out the truth. The next morning, I packed up and headed back to the city, determined to get to the bottom of this mystery. The fear and confusion were still there, but now they were accompanied by a newfound resolve. I had to understand what was happening to me and why I had been chosen for this strange and terrifying journey. As I drove back, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. The road ahead seemed long and uncertain, but I knew one thing for sure. I couldn't turn back now. The black-eyed boys had pulled me into their world, and I had no choice but to see it through to the end. Back in the city, I wasted no time diving into research. My first stop was the library, where I pored over books on urban legends, curses, and paranormal phenomena. The more I read, the more I realized how little I knew. There were countless stories of encounters with black-eyed children, but none offered a clear explanation or solution. Frustrated, I turned to the internet, scouring forums and websites dedicated to the supernatural. I posted my story hoping someone might have insight or advice. Responses ranged from the skeptical to the sympathetic, but one message stood out. It was from a user named Seeker who claimed to have had a similar encounter and offered to help. Intrigued and desperate for answers, I responded, and we arranged to meet at a small calf downtown. The next day, I arrived early, my mind racing with questions. I sat at a corner table, anxiously watching the door. After a few minutes, a woman in her thirties walked in, scanning the room until her eyes met mine. She approached with a cautious smile. John, she asked, extending her hand. I'm Emily. Nice to meet you, Emily, I said, shaking her hand. Thanks for agreeing to meet. We ordered coffee and sat down the atmosphere tense with unspoken questions. Emily took a sip of her drink before speaking. I read your post, your story. It struck a chord with me. I've encountered black-eyed children too. My heart skipped a beat. Really? What happened? Emily nodded, her expression somber. 
A few years ago, I had a similar experience. Two children appeared at my door late one night, asking me to come in. I felt an overwhelming sense of dread, as you described. I refused, and they eventually left. But that wasn't the end of it. She paused, glancing around the calf as if checking for eavesdroppers. I started seeing them everywhere. They followed me, just like they're following you. I spent months trying to figure out what they wanted. That's when I met Dr. Alan Harper. Who's Dr. Harper? I asked, leaning forward. He's a paranormal researcher, Emily explained. He's been studying phenomena like this for decades. He helped me understand what was happening and gave me tools to protect myself. You need to talk to him. I felt a glimmer of hope. Do you have his contact information? Emily nodded, pulling out her phone. She typed quickly and handed it to me. Here's his number and email. Tell him I sent you. I thanked Emily, feeling a surge of determination. This was the lead I needed. We talked for a while longer, exchanging stories and theories, but my mind was already focused on contacting Dr. Harper. That evening, I called the number Emily had given me. After a few rings, a voice answered. Dr. Harper speaking. Dr. Harper, my name is John. Emily referred me to you. I need your help. There was a brief pause. Emily told me about you. Why don't you come by my office tomorrow? We can discuss your situation in detail. We arranged a time and I hung up, feeling a mixture of anxiety and relief. I had a meeting with someone who might finally provide the answers I desperately needed. The next day, I arrived at Dr. Harper's office, a small, cluttered space filled with books and strange artifacts. Dr. Harper, a middle-aged man with kind eyes and a calm demeanor, greeted me and gestured for me to sit. Tell me everything, he said, leaning back in his chair. I recounted my encounters with the black-eyed boys, the basement ritual, and the cryptic messages. Dr. Harper listened intently, nodding occasionally and jotting down notes. When I finished, he sighed. You've been drawn into something very old and very dangerous. Black-eyed children are not just urban legends. They're entities that feed on fear and seek to enter our world. But why me? I asked, frustration creeping into my voice. Why am I the only one who can see them? Dr. Harper looked thoughtful. Certain people have a sensitivity to the paranormal, a kind of sixth sense. You might have an innate ability to perceive things others can't. That makes you both a target and a potential key to stopping them. I felt a chill run down my spine. What do I do now? There are ways to protect yourself, Dr. Harper said, handing me a small amulet. This will help shield you from their influence, but you need to confront them again and find out what they truly want. Only then can we figure out how to stop them for good. I took the amulet, its weight reassuring in my hand. How do I find them? They'll find you, Dr. Harper said simply. But this time, you'll be ready. Leaving to Dr. Harper's office, I felt a renewed sense of purpose. The fear was still there, but now was tempered with determination. I had allies, tools, and a plan. The black-eyed boys wouldn't haunt me forever. I would uncover their secrets and put an end to this nightmare once and for all. Armed with the amulet and Dr. Harper's advice, I waited. Days turned into weeks, but there was no sign of the black-eyed boys. I tried to go about my daily life, but the constant fear of their return hung over me like a dark cloud. One evening, as I was leaving work, I felt a familiar chill run down my spine. I turned around and saw them standing at the end of the street, their black eyes fixed on me. This time, however, I was ready. I approached them, the amulet clutched tightly in my hand. The boys didn't move, their expressions were unreadable. What do you want? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. We need your help, the first boy said, his voice soft. I've already helped you, I said, stepping closer. I broke the curse. Why are you still here? The boys exchanged a glance, and then the second boy spoke. The curse is broken but we're still trapped between worlds. We need your help to move on. How? I asked, my grip on the amulet tightening. You need to open a gateway, the first boy explained. The ritual is in the book. We can't do it ourselves. I hesitated. Opening a gateway to another world sounded dangerous, but I also knew I couldn't leave them trapped here. Taking a deep breath, I nodded. 
Show me. The boys led me to a secluded spot in the park, far from prying eyes. They showed me the passage in the book, and together we began the ritual. The air grew thick with energy, and I felt a pulling sensation as if something was trying to tug me away. As the ritual reached its climax, a blinding light engulfed us. When it faded, the boys were gone. I was alone, but a sense of peace washed over me. I had fulfilled my part, and the boys were finally free. I returned home, exhausted but relieved. The nightmare was over, and I could finally move on with my life. As I drifted off to sleep that night, I felt a sense of closure, knowing that I had helped two lost souls find their way home. In the days that followed, life returned to normal. The fear that had plagued me for so long began to fade, replaced by a sense of peace and closure. I threw myself into work, grateful for the distraction and the opportunity to move forward. I kept in touch with Dr. Harper and Emily, grateful for their guidance and support. They helped me process what had happened and assured me that I had done the right thing. I was no longer haunted by the black-eyed boys, but their memory lingered, a reminder of the strange and mysterious world that existed just beyond our perception. As time passed, I began to feel grateful for the experience. It had been terrifying and challenging, but it had also taught me valuable lessons about courage, empathy, and the unseen forces that shape our world. I felt stronger and more confident in my ability to face whatever challenges lay ahead. One evening, as I sat on my balcony watching the sunset, a sense of peace washed over me. The sky was painted in hues of orange and pink, a reminder that even in the darkest of times, there is always beauty and light. I thought back to the black-eyed boys, wondering where they were now and if they had found the peace they sought. I hoped that wherever they were, they were finally free. As darkness fell and the stars began to twinkle overhead, I made a silent promise to myself. I will never forget the lessons I learned or the strange and terrifying journey that led me to this moment. As I closed my eyes and breathed in the cool night air, I knew that no matter what challenges lay ahead, I would face them with courage and determination, secure in the knowledge that I had faced my fears and emerged stronger on the other side. Months had passed since the encounter with the black-eyed boys, and life had settled into a new normal. The memory of that time still lingered, but it no longer held the same grip of fear and uncertainty. I sat in my favorite spot in the park, a place that had become my sanctuary during those dark days. The sun was shining, and the sounds of laughter and conversation filled the air. It was hard to believe that just a short time ago I had been consumed by fear and doubt. As I watched the world go by, I reflected on everything that had happened. The strange encounters, the ancient curse, the rituals. All of it seemed like a distant dream, but the lessons I had learned were real and profound. I had learned the power of facing my fears head on, of not letting them control me. I learned the importance of empathy and understanding, even in the face of the unknown. And most importantly, I learned that there was more to this world than meets the eye and that there are forces at work beyond our comprehension. As the sun began to set, casting a golden glow over the park, I made a silent vow to carry these lessons with me always. I will never forget the journey I had taken, nor the people who had helped me along the way. As I stood up to leave, ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead, I felt a sense of peace and gratitude wash over me. The world was full of mysteries and wonders, and I was ready to embrace them all. As the seasons changed and time marched forward, I found myself embracing new beginnings. The darkness of the past was behind me, replaced by a sense of hope and possibility. I had faced my fears and emerged stronger, ready to embrace whatever the future held. I had returned to my passion for astronomy, spending hours under the night sky, marveling at the beauty and vastness of the universe. I felt a sense of connection to something greater than myself, a reminder that there was so much more to discover and explore. I also found myself drawn to helping others who had experienced the unexplainable. I volunteered at a local paranormal research group, sharing my story and offering support to those who were still struggling with their encounters. It was cathartic, a way to turn my own experience into something positive. One evening, as I was setting up my telescope in the park, a young couple approached me 
They had heard about my work with the research group and wanted to share their own experience, a sighting of strange lights in the sky. As we talked, I felt a sense of kinship with them, a shared understanding of the mysteries of the universe. As I looked through my telescope, pointing out constellations and planets, I realized that my journey was far from over. There were still mysteries to unravel, adventures to be had, and lessons to be learned. But I was no longer afraid. I was ready to embrace whatever came my way, secure in the knowledge that I had faced the unknown and emerged stronger for it. As the night sky stretched out before me, filled with stars and infinite possibilities, I knew that my story was just beginning. As I packed up my telescope and headed home, I did so with a sense of excitement for the future, eager to see where the universe would take me next. Years had passed since my encounter with the black-eyed boys, and their memory had faded into the background of my life. I had moved on, embracing new adventures and challenges, but the lessons I had learned during that time stayed with me always. I had become an advocate for understanding the unexplained, speaking at conferences and writing articles about my experiences. I had met others who had faced similar encounters and together we formed a community of believers and skeptics, united by a shared curiosity about the mysteries of the universe. One day, as I was preparing for another lecture, I received a letter in the mail. It was from Emily, the woman who had helped me in my time of need. She had moved away shortly after our meeting, and we had lost touch. The letter was brief but heartfelt, thanking me for my friendship and support. Tucked inside the letter was a newspaper clipping. It was an obituary for Dr. Alan Harper, the paranormal researcher who had helped me understand the black-eyed boys. He had passed away peacefully in his sleep, surrounded by his loved ones. I felt a pang of sadness at the news. Dr. Harper had been a guiding light during a dark time in my life and I will be forever grateful for his wisdom and guidance. I vowed to honor his memory by continuing my work in the field of paranormal research, seeking answers to the unexplained, and helping others find peace and understanding. As I stood before the audience that evening, sharing my story and the lessons I had learned, I felt a sense of purpose and fulfillment. The journey had been long and challenging, but it had led me to this moment where I could use my experiences to inspire others and shed light on the mysteries of the universe. As I looked out at the faces in the crowd, I knew that my story was just one of many, each filled with its trials and triumphs. But together, we were united in our quest for knowledge and understanding, forever seeking the truth that lay just beyond our reach.